we are very happy to be here and um, I will start uh, with introducing uh, Tiffany on my left or right, it depends. <laughs> Tiffany is one of our ex-students. She graduated last June and she's been here for more than a quarter of her lifetime, I think. So basically, uh, she did the whole uh, studies, BA and master at the school, and uh, she really got interested in um, the archives of Jacques de Villers. And uh, she will tell you uh, in the second part of this presentation what she's been doing for a master project and where she's heading to. And uh, I will start with presenting uh, who was Jacques de Villers first. So I guess very few of you have heard of this guy. Um, I came across Jacques de Villers um, around 2009. At the time, I was uh, doing some research about uh, Roger Escoffon and the Olive Foundry, and I noticed uh, some uh, lettering works uh, published in Caractère Noël, uh, which was a yearly, uh, big yearly book supervised by Maximilien Vox and gathering um, the, the, the French and international graphic design and typographic scene at the moment. And in uh, the 1953 edition, there was this uh, a series of portraits gathering who was the, this new generation of typographer, graphic designer in France. And then this is a, where I found uh, the first um, portrait of Jacques de Villers on the left with uh, Roger Escoffon on the right. So um, you have to uh, understand the connection with de Villers and Amiens. He was born in this city in 1921. And um, in during the war and after the war, actually, with his brothers and sister, he was part of a choir. And he began to design the, the booklets, the programs of the, the choir for their performances. So this is how he got into graphic design. And then he, he, he had an internship with Maximilien Vox in Paris. And in 1950, he was recruited by uh, Roger Scoffon at the Olive Foundry. And he worked there for a couple of years. And then after 1952, uh, he set up his own practice as a freelance designer and he worked until basically uh, the notice, uh, doing lots of various graphic design works. Um, I'm going to, to show you, of course, some examples of his um, work. So there's a, an interesting story for this school, um, how serendipity triggered research. Um, so in 2009, Catherine de Smet, who is on this picture, was teaching uh, in this school. Uh, Catherine de Smet is a graphic design historian. And um, she knew that I was, was doing some research on Excofon. And one day she, she tells me, yeah, uh, you know, in my family, uh, there was a graphic designer who died uh, last year. So they don't know what to do with uh, his body of work. So they need to clear the space, etc." So And uh, she tells me, he worked for Olive, uh, and I'm like, is it Jacques de Villers? And she says, yes. <laughs> I say, okay, let's, let's go. <laughs> and this is the first visit. So I took this picture, you have Catherine, and then on the left, this is Geneviève de Villers, the widow of Jacques de Villers. So this is the entrance of the main workshop of uh, Jacques de Villers. So you have the library here on both sides. And this is what it looked like. Basically, one year after his death, nothing had changed almost 60 years of graphic design work stuck together. So his working library, his type, type specimen library, and, and all any kind of sketches. Um, he, and he was somehow quite good uh, at archiving his own work and during his lifetime. So it was very convenient for us to start digging into the boxes and try to figure out how he, he could organize uh, decade after decade uh, his own work. And then, of course, during this first visit, we were very happy to find this kind of stuff. Totally unknown sketches for uh, graphic design work for uh, the Fondry Olive. So this, these are sketches for the, the cover of the Banco Specimen, Banco designed by Excofo in 1951. Hello, Dan. <laughs> And we found also this kind of sketches um, showing that 
De Villers was involved into developing series of Vendôme, who, a typeface that was designed by François Gano in the early 50s, with some input by Excoffon. And uh, so, during his two years stay at the foundry, De Villers had his hands on many kinds of jobs, so graphic design, uh, working on development of series of the of Vendôme, for instance. So, for us, it was quite amazing to find this kind of document at the moment. So, we were very happy, I mean, for this Excoffon project. And we began to dig and dig and dig. So uh, imagine that in France and in other countries in the 50s, it was very difficult to set up a practice as a type designer because you need to rely on the old metal foundries. So in the 50s, you had Frutiger on the left uh, at the Bernier Peignot and you had Excoff on the right or in the south <laughs> with uh, Olive. And in between, you would have Marcel Jacquenot. So De Villers, I guess, wanted, and he did, design potential typefaces. And uh, throughout his whole career, he, he designed a wide range of typefaces that, of course, were never produced for metal type or phototype setting or whatsoever. So we found lots of alphabets. And um, the way these drawings were made are showing that he was properly trained at Olive during his two years stay. But he, he would use his own um, alphabet to create um, titling and designs for the posters, for the booklets, for the book and record covers he would uh, make uh, all day long. So this was, I would say, a, a way for him to somehow show his, uh, the diversity of his work as a potential type designer. So he, he, he was a letter type designer, I would say. and. Um, this made a huge difference in many of his designs, having his own uh, homemade typefaces, I would say. And uh, of course, he designed a lot of logotypes. At some point, as you can see on the left, uh, he designed a logotype for a type pipe. So his career was made from different kinds of graphic design, uh, letter design work. So. Quickly, with Catherine uh, and the family, we agreed that it would be good to make something from uh, this stuff. And the family offered in uh, the first time to give us uh, the library of the Villers, so books, type specimens. So we received this donation uh, within a few months. Uh, so these books, these specimens, they are here in one of the rooms of the school. and. Um, we decided to organize a few months after an exhibition to celebrate the work of the Villers. So basically between July and November, we set up this exhibition. We organized uh, the moving of the library to the school, so it went very fast. And this is Catherine Desmet with Thomas Marchand, who was uh, teaching at the time here uh, for the postgraduate course uh, and the master's students in type design. So um, we made the selections of documents, books, um, taken from the archive and we organized this exhibition in a very easy way. We had the support of one of our teachers, uh, Rémi dumas prambo who uh, created the specific scenography. And we had an opening, of course. So you can see here, looking at you, Geneviève de Villers and the whole family, the, the, the sons and daughters of Jacques de Villers came uh, at the opening, so it was quite a nice moment. You can spot Alisa, who was still a student here. So time flies, it's more than 10 years, but we are still alive, so that's good. So we can share this uh, this moment. Um, and then afterwards, uh, it didn't stop there. We thought that that could be it, but the family was quite welcoming in giving us the whole archive. I mean, giving to the city, uh, of Amiens, the, uh, the body of work of Jacques de Villers. So this is it now. So you, you saw how it was in his workshop. And now it's here, it's, it's in the room next door, the, in the coffee room, it's hidden. There's a door at the back of the room. So this is where it is stored. So um, in 2010, we made all the paperwork. And then in 2011, um, everything arrived and was organized as um, best as possible by uh, Peggy Le Tup, the chief of the doc, 
was here. And uh, so uh, some students of the postgraduate course also over the years helped us. We had also a couple of students uh, from a, a, a master in archive um, from the Ecole des Chartes who helped us to establish very quickly a catalog of the whole thing. So we have a catalog. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do from, from this archive. So if we can focus on one possibility to use this body of work, of course it's obvious that there was a lot to do from all the sketches, drawings for these non-typefaces that would become digital typefaces. So Titus, who was teaching here, uh, made the first uh, big workshop with the master's students in 2011, and then the second one in 2013 with the students of SAT type at the time. So here are some examples of the, the typefaces that were digitized and somehow revived uh, by the, the group of students uh, who, was there, who was there in 2013. So. It was quite a lot of fun. So these are except of the type specimen they produced uh, under the supervision of Titus. And in these archives, you have lots of uh, different kind of uh, work that were made by De Villers, of course. So we have sketches. Uh, original designs, uh, printed uh, stuff like record sleeves. He did a lot of record sleeves, so I'm just showing you a couple of them. And you have to know that De Villers uh, was a Catholic, and so a huge part of uh, his clients were Catholic institutions, cultural Catholic um, companies, uh, associations, so he did a lot of work for them. And uh, he had a, a short uh, stint with the Club Francais du Livre in the mid 50s. So again, we have uh, several folders with his sketches. Uh, we have also a series of uh, the books that were made. So that's uh, quite an interesting resource for researchers um, that who wants to study the history of um, publishing in France. So the Club Francais du Livre was quite a handsome series of books, but he, De Villers also designed pocket books and he designed the identity uh, of the Gelu series. So these are only a few excerpts of uh, this archive. And in his lifetime, he only had a couple of publications documenting his work. So <coughs> in 1974, there was uh, a booklet and then in 1982, uh, a special issue of the magazine Zodiac. So, and so far, that's it. So mm, it's been 40 years, nothing was made from uh, his work. So of course, we hope that someday we'll be able to, to, to make a proper publication and um, working, drawing from the archives. And there's more in this archive. De Villers attended basically all Atipai congresses from 1957 to the early 1990s, and he kept everything. Correspondence, so we have a, a huge folder of uh, letters, memos, uh, working documents on the establishment of the status of the Atai Pai. So uh, this is one uh, official letter signed by Charles Peignot. Um, so that's quite to do for researchers who like Atai Pai here. <laughs> And um, also notes, for instance, this is part of a uh, notebook from De Villers where he's documenting discussion in Atipai Barcelona between Frutiger, Mendoza, Zap, very interesting stuff to help understand some proceedings about copyright issues and how to make it work. Uh, so, and um, at this moment, uh, we have an online uh, website that is collecting several parts of uh, our archive. So only a small part of the whole archive of De Villers has been documented through photography and digitization because it's a huge lot of documents. But in the future, we hope to have a proper website working on uh, a database um, documenting basically everything he's been doing. And this is now the time for me to pass the mic to Tiffany. During this last year of master's program, I became interested in the professional writings of archivists um, through a field survey in different archive locations. Then I carried out my master project on the valorization 
an exploration of the archives of a French graphic designer, Jacques de Villers. The um, archives of Jacques de Villers should be, in theory, available for consultation and used for researchers. Even if the archives were given by, by the de Villers family 11 years ago, they remain unused. In 2011, two archival master students produced an index during the first cataloging of the archives. This is the index. And the index they created was too similar to the archive group, group classification. The documents are described in a formal way without adapting the terminology to the archive itself. Regarding the page layout, it is often very difficult to read chronological and linear. These are the two main issues that I tried to address while working on my master project. The archive contains 2,607 inputs, but only 973 documents are processed one by one. The remaining documents are sorted by box or folder. The ones which are treated separately are documents that don't fit into archival boxes because of their size. I focused only on these documents uh, as it was impossible for me to look at everything in such a short period of time and on my own. Moreover, there are also the same documents that were the subject of a second treatment by Quentin Schmerber, a former student of the school who photographed and recognition them in 2015. Like a photography of documents. Therefore, based on the index, I began to create a terminology in order to adapt the research terms to the nature of the archives. I listed the categories that seemed important for my design practice, like uh, Excel. <laughs> The, um, the categories are presented as such. Uh, the medium which determines if it's a poster, a leaflet, a flyer, or something else. The um, documents type which designates uh, in which stage of the work process the document is. Uh, for example, a print leftover, a sketch, a mock-up, uh, the color. The um, project which provides information about the event for which the document was created, if it's for a concert, a festival, an exhibition, or anything else. The lettering, identification of the lettering used for the design of the different documents since Jacques de Villers designed most of the alphabets he used. The dim dim dimension, and finally the archiving method, which indicates the conditioning of the document was it's in the archive room here uh, behind me. Um, it determines if it's rolled word up in a file or in a plan file cabinet, for example, in order to facilitate the use of documents researcher for potential consultation. After that, I studied the different ways of uh, representing these categories. We can, take, make, we can make the same observation. We don't understand the plurality and the diversity of the content to the archives. I also kept in my mind a wish for quantification. We knew the number of linear meters, but not the number of alphabet designs or the number of documents made for a specific client or association, meaning all the information that finally gives a better overview of the work of a graphic designer. So for my master project, I created um, a website and a paper index to replace the previous one shown at the beginning of my presentation. So I just a uh, few um, uh, documents archives. This is a book, uh, um, letterings, and other. Mm. So the um, the web for the website I choose to design one because it allows many research options, uh, especially 
Regarding the cross-referencing of data, it's also very, very useful to initiate only online exploration, which is so the, sorry. Uh, indeed, as you need to be allowed to consult the archives, it means almost impossible that you have previously formulated a special request. Thanks to the online exploration, we are no longer ob obliged to have a special permission to have access to the archives. As a result, you can go on the website and get some inspiration just by exploring the website. The website works on the basis of data visualization widgets, which is a portmanteau word to designate both of form and usage. The data visualization can allow the user to see at a glance the quantification of the archives. You can see the graphic on the left. The number of posters compared to the number of books, the number of productions from one year to another and many other things. The widget will allow the user to make a selection um, among this information in order to refine the exploration possibilities. Each diagram takes a different shape to be accurate to content and represent. The um, research result can be printed and used as a memory aid to find the document in the, doc the archive room, this memory aid will also help to track to the consultation of archives. Today, when I think back uh, about uh, this master project, I think I would make some changes. Uh, for instance, I would add new categories such as also since the archives include Jacques de Villers' uh, collection of posters from other designers. I would also add a printed process category, which seems to me to be another essential, essential point in the research of graphic uh, production. Finally, the website is the opportunity uh, for the school to raise awareness about the group, to attract researchers, um, to serve as a support for teachers' courses and for students looking for documentation or simply for inspiration. This archive also helps to give an idea of a graphic designer career during the second half of the last century, which is a very in interesting case study for students in art design schools. After writing a dissertation in, and developing this project, I decided to begin a new master's degree focused on research at uh, the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. I, want to, I wanted to develop my knowledge of, the, of archivists' uh, writings, which allows me to better understand archival treatments and their impact on research in France today. Therefore, I'm thinking about doing a PhD uh, about this subject still in relation with the valorization of uh, Jacques de Villers archives. And this is my research for the moment. <laughs> and thank you. Okay, ah. now it works. Okay, thank now you very much. Stopped. It was very interesting. I just want to add one short uh, correction um, to my recollection. I only did the first workshop uh, of, of reviving the alphabets and the second one was run by uh, Alice Savoy. Okay, so this is my mistake. I'm sorry. I apologize. I publicly apologize to both of you. <laughs> I made a confusion. Okay, I... I okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> credit to Alice. Should, should I record that? <laughs> You're saying it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. So, you good. I'm glad to hear that this archive was purchased by the city and is available here at the school. Um, instead of it uh, being with descendants of the, uh, of the designer or with a private institution, uh, are there other uh, graphic designer archives in France and what kind of institutions tend to have them, if there are any? Ah, okay, so I can answer that question. Um, for instance, the archive of Marcel Jacquenot uh, are currently uh, belonging to um, uh, one person who is taking 
care. Uh, yeah, for, it's part of the family. Well, it's a long story, but they are in a house in the suburb of Paris still at the moment. So for many years recently, there was lots of moving uh, in these archives. Uh, someone uh, was working to make a book and an exhibition, but it's still not coming. And then we were um, um, in 2015, Alice was here. As I remember, I'm correct this, on this point. And then w with the uh, postgraduate students, we decided to organize an exhibition and a revival uh, workshop from several unpublished typefaces of Jacques No uh, and lettering. Uh, so this was um, a way of connecting to this archive and to make it more visible. So uh, it was uh, quite a challenging uh, process for the students and all of us, but uh, I think the result was quite brilliant. Uh, you have some images online uh, on the um, on both uh, our websites. Um, so we got to know these archives uh, and the students made several visits at the time. Uh, Hugh is in the assistant, so if you want to know more about this process, he can tell you. And um, so this gave us a good idea about how people could take care of these archives. but. I think that at some point that would be better to have this archive in a proper institution location, but uh, it's quite complex. Uh, the, the French National Library is not that much interested in graphic design and type design archive. In Caen, uh, you have the Institut Mémoire de l'Édition Contemporaine, who is more focused on publishers and writers' archives, but they have a small um, collections of graphic designers archive, um, a part of the Vox archive, and especially uh, thanks to her work, uh, the archives of Excofon. They are there, and you can go to uh, Emec in Caen and have a look to this stuff. So, but, but that's just an exception. I mean, there's still a lot to do to preserve the, the archives of, of graphic and type designers in France. So. Uh, the Centre National des Arts Plastiques is doing a lot uh, of work in the past years because they've been given uh, archives of many graphic designers and type designers as well. Um, so this is the main effort, I think, uh, in the level of institutions, cultural institutions in France uh, at the moment. Um, but I know about private archives of type designers and I don't know how and uh, we can work from these archives. Um, when I did the research on Excofon, I got to meet the widow of François Gano, and uh, I could find a lot of very interesting documents, but they are still belonging to the Gano family. Uh, José Mendoza died uh, almost two years ago, and he left a lot of work, uh, all the drawings for, for, for his typefaces, uh, uh, and it's still there. I mean, it belongs to the family, so um, of course we should care about what's left, being left, uh, but so far there is no official policy, and I think maybe one institution could could leave the could leave the way uh, to um, yeah go and meet families of designers who are keen on keeping as much as possible uh, the body of work. And De Villers is quite an exception. I mean, it's, it's a basically once in a lifetime opportunity to collect such a big archive, a lifetime archive of graphic designers, as um, Tiffany said, from the second half of the 20th century. So we can do a lot of things from these archives. Um, so yeah, maybe at some point we should make a, another project and say, okay, uh, we would like to organize a, a collect, I would say, uh, how to get uh, a good location for these archives. Um, but we need space, we need money, we need time, always the same problem. Thank you. Uh, I have just one question for Tiffany. You said you wanted to do a PhD. Are yeah. you thinking of doing it at OHUSS or are you thinking to have some kind of partnership with the school here? Is there any plan yet? For the moment, I don't know, but this is a project. I want to do a PhD with um, 
uh, tutor de, de supervisor. Uh, yeah, a supervisor in EHSS and maybe Sébastien in in ESAD, but this is not the time, but maybe. Okay. Thank you. I have a question, actually. Um, so when he was doing all the drawing, I'm curious to know if if he also documented it or reflected on the drawing, wrote some some notes apart from dates. Did he do any of this? He has a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, hell, basically, he was keeping uh, everything. The problem is that when you open a folder and uh, you have a mix up of uh, lots of photostat uh, papers and um, photocopies, original drawing, sketches on tracing paper, so sometimes it's, of course, it's a problem to create a methodology to study such archives because it's such a, uh, a mixed bag of things inside a, a folder. Tiffany can tell you a lot about that. And then still, I, th I think we need to, to, to invent uh, specific categorizations. And um, in a ideal world, we would have scanned everything, you know, uh, and then taking images of the, the raw stuff from the box. And of course, we had to... to, to to alter the archive because it was moved from one place to another, put into these boxes that you, you show, uh, the posters. Um, it's very difficult to preserve uh, the archive. I mean, we, it would have been great to take as many pictures uh, as possible from the original space, um, yeah, to document the whole process. So we did it uh, with the, the means we had at the time, and uh, we, we were very fortunate. It took us one year and a half between discovering the archive and welcoming it in the school. So we, it was quite a rush process, but uh, everything was smooth because we found the right people at the right time to help us. And so we made sure that it was safe in a safe place, as safe as possible here in the school. Uh, and we are really eager to, to welcome researchers uh, in the near future. So this is why it's important to make this archive uh, better known um, through various means, online means, a publication that we good, maybe a, a conference, so we have lots of possibilities in the coming year. So, um, When Catherine was still teaching at the school, Catherine de Smet, uh, we had some plans, but um, she, she had to leave uh, for another position in Paris, and then somehow we never go further. So it's just staying in, in the the limbo. <laughs> so maybe someday we will be able to to resume the project with Catherine or with someone else, but um, there, there are lots of opportunities for researchers in this archive, so... And was was there, this is maybe for Tiffany, if, if there were type sketches in different stages, did you did you react to this in the indexing system, or, or it's at, at the Timeline. So first sketch, second sketch, maybe then final sketch. Oh yeah, it's possible. But um, the letterings are in a very big folder, and they are not um, cataloging. And I, I think they are not uh, the dates in the, the in the archive, but. Maybe it's possible um, uh, for if we want to do uh, this, uh, we want to have uh, more Sebastian and more persons to know the characters and the date and the life of, Graf uh, of uh, Jacques de Villers. So basically, I'm taking a sabbatical of one year to do it. <laughs> Thank you. I could do it. I would be very happy to do it. <laughs> Can you fund it? <laughs> no. That's the problem. We, we, we need some time, we need some people, we need some money, it's always the same problem. And uh, of course it would be good at some point to, to launch a proper uh, survey of the archive, basically opening all the boxes and checking how things are. I like these uh, students who did this catalog uh, nine years ago and they were very efficient and very fast to do it. Uh, so, yeah, we need to resume this part of the work because the other day when we made the selections of documents that are in the documentation center with Peggy and um, 
Tiffany, we were amazed, you know, just because for me it was the first time basically in 10 years that could go in this room where I am in the school most, a lot of time and I don't have the time to go there, you know, just to dig. We, first knowing that it's here, that it's safe, that's enough, but when finally you can go back into this room and then you look at this stuff and you're like very frustrated and happy at the same time. Frustrated because you don't have the time to go deeper and happy because you know it's here at, at some point in your life you will be able to come back well and then you retired and then it's over and then, this is why you need to pass on to to students and, and young people i mean it's part of our job to train the young generation but it's very difficult to attract uh, students uh, in doing research in history of typography so uh, tiffany is a unusual case so we are very happy to have her and I hope she's not going to disappear that far. So if we manage to make this course supervision maybe someday for her PhD in a few years, so because she has to finish her master first, okay. Uh, so that's very promising and we hope to have new students. So maybe at some point we can make a call for research project from this archive. That's quite realistic. We just need some money and some time to do it, but uh, the stuff is here.